program. One of them is Marjan Yavmai, Associate Professor of Medical Genetics at Oncology, Hematology, and Cell Therapy Research Institute at Tehran University of Medical Sciences and head of the leading house for Iran North America Academic Partnership. We are pleased to present the eighth course of the webinar series entitled How I Treat Hematologic Malignancies, which provides a great academic opportunity for Iranian hematologists and fellows to interact as well as share and exchange their knowledge and experiences with Iranian academic experts in the field of hematology. Okay, now let's begin our today's webinar. But before we start, I would like to express my special thanks to Dr. Maziar Shatman, Associate Professor of Medical Oncology at the University of Washington, who helped me to organize this series. And also my appreciation to the Appraise to Race team from Tehran University of Medical Sciences for their great effort and support making this program possible. Here I pass the microphone to Dr. Shadman to start the program and introduce our valued guest speaker, Dr. Bita Fakhri, and then ask our moderator, Dr. Rezwani from Shiraz University of Medical Sciences to start the program. Dr. Shadman, please. Hello everyone. I would like to say uh, hi to my colleagues in Iran and also uh, audience from around the world. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bita Fakhri. Dr. Fakhri is, a, is an assistant professor of medicine uh, Department of Hematology and Oncology at University of California, San Francisco, UCSF. She's a graduate of Iran Medical University. After that, she uh, finished her uh, MPH training at Yale University, followed by residency training at Boston University and Boston Medical Center. Uh, and then she uh, uh, moved to St. Louis to uh, finish her fellowship in hematology and medical oncology at Washington University in St. Louis. After that, she moved to San Francisco uh, as a faculty at the UCSF. And uh, she has been very active nationally at, uh, focusing on lymphoid malignancies, uh, non-Hodgkin lymphomas and chronic lymphocytic leukemia, also cellular therapy, uh, mainly focused on lymphoid malignancies. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, uh, have her here today, and uh, I would like to thank her for accepting this invitation. With that, I will give the microphone to Dr. Aswani to start the program. Thank you. Dr. Rezwani. Dr. Rezwani, if you can hear me, you can start the program. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, my colleague. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to How I Treat Hematic Malignancy webinar. Uh, we are very grateful to my dear colleague, Dr. Yavmai, for their tremendous support. They have provided us house, and particularly to you, my distinguished colleague, for taking the time and attending this seminar. First of all, I would like to point out that all questions and comments are welcome. You can easily type in the chat segment or raise your hand if any possible question arise. Thank you all again. And without any further ado, let's start up. Uh, Dr. Fahri, microphone is yours. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. And I hope it's going to be a productive session for all of us. I'm going to share my slides. So, um, I don't want to rush the talk. I have um, slides on um, high-grade B-cell lymphomas. And also, if I have time, I'll talk to you about mantle cell lymphoma and T-cell lymphoma. Um, so every time, um, this is a talk that I give to my fellows uh, all the time. Um, every time I see a lymphoma patient in clinic, just to simplify things for them, I tell them that in lymphoma, in the field of lymphoid malignancies, we love dividing. There are two major types of lymphoma, B-cell lymphomas and T-cell lymphomas. B-cell lymphomas are more common. 
And then B-cell lymphomas, again, are divided into two major categories, Hodgkin lymphoma and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. But that's just like saying CARs are Honda and non-Honda. So non-Hodgkin lymphoma can be anything. And then again, to make it a little easier for them to perceive and understand, non-Hodgkin lymphomas, again, are divided into two major categories. Aggressive lymphomas, that if left untreated, they can take someone's life in a few months and um, the good news about them, they're mostly highly curable. And then you have indolent, lazy, slow-growing lymphomas that um, don't necessarily kill the patient, but can become problematic by causing symptoms. So this is a di diagram of the frequency of different kinds of lymphomas. Um, as you see, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is about 30% of non-Hodgkin lymphomas, and it's the most common aggressive B-cell lymphoma. Then you have follicular lymphoma, 22%, which is the most common indolent um, or slow growing lymphoma. Then you have with um, less frequency SLL or CLL, the name is um, used interchangeably based on where the clone prefers to reside. You have mantle cell lymphoma, which is a newer lymphoma. It was introduced in the 90s as an independent entity to the classification of lymphoid malignancies. And now we know that the majority of patients with mantle cell lymphoma, they have an aggressive course. 6%, about 6% is peripheral T cell lymphomas. And um, the treatment in the recent years have changed and their outcomes have improved in the recent years. Then you have other indolent lymphomas, 6%, marginal zone lymphoma. So um, there are three types of marginal zone lymphoma. There is the nodal type, about 1%, and then you also have extra nodal and um, splenic marginal zone lymphoma, about 5%. And then about 1% um, is lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma or Waldenstrom. My talk is mostly going to focus on aggressive lymphomas. And I'll try to basically dissect diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and high-grade B-cell lymphomas. So um, as you probably know, the World Health Organization has a classification system. And every eight years, the experts, clinical experts, translational, translational experts, and molecular experts, they get together. And based on what we have learned, particularly in the molecular field, they revise the classification. So based on this classification, again, you have indolent lymphomas that we talked about like SLL, CLL, Waldenstrom, hairy cell leukemia, splenic marginal zone lymphoma, and then you have nodal and extra nodal marginal zone lymphoma, the old name based on, uh, for extra nodal marginal zone lymphoma based on the location was, if it was in the stomach, mucosal associated lymphoid tissue, if it was in the lungs, it used to be bald, bronchial associated lymphoid tissue, if it used to be in the skin, they called it salt or skin associated lymphoid tissue, but right now they're all categorized under the category of extra nodal marginal zone lymphoma. And then you have low grade follicular lymphomas, which is mostly grade one, two, and three A. Then you have aggressive lymphomas like follicular lymphoma grade three B, which, um, which has a tendency to behave like diffuse large B cell lymphoma. You have prolymphocytic leukemia mantle cell lymphoma, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, primary mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma, which used to be a subset of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. But now we know that although morphologically it looks like diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, but in terms of molecular um, signatures, it has a lot of overlap with Hodgkin lymphoma in terms of um, when they studied, they realized that both Hodgkin and primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma, they have um, 9P24 amplification, which results in, uh, which is the locus that expresses JAK and um, PD1 um, genes. And so there is drug opportunity, there are drug opportunities that uh, are similar for both primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma and Hodgkin lymphoma, like using PD1 and PDL1 inhibitors. And then there are some other lymphomas that historically they were first defined in HIV patient population, uh, like primary effusion lymphoma, plasmoblastic lymphoma. But nowadays we know that these are associated with immune suppression. So they can happen in any patient who is immune suppressed for whatever reason. They have an autoimmune disorder, they've been on um, immune sup and they've been on an immune suppressive regimen for a long time, and um, then they develop lymphoma. 
or they can be seen in, um, you know, post transplant in the post transplant lymphoproliferative disorder setting. Someone who's had a solid organ transplant, and then the pathology is plasmablastic lymphoma. And here on the far right, you have very aggressive lymphomas like lymphoblastic lymphoma. You have Burkitt's lymphoma. You have high-grade B-cell lymphoma NOS, not otherwise specified. And in the 2016 classification of lymphoid malignancies, WHO introduced um, high-grade B-cell lymphoma with MIC and BCL2 um, and or BCL2, um, MIC, BCL2 and or BCL6 gene rearrangement, which used to be called double hit. And just to save time, I'm going to call this entity double hit for the sake of this talk. But the correct nomenclature is high-grade B-cell lymphoma with MIC, BCL2 and or BCL6 gene rearrangement. So um, just to give you an idea of where mantle cell lymphoma is, this is uh, mantle cell lymphoma was first introduced as an independent entity in 1994. And this is the, in the pre-rituximab era, they were trying to make sense of this lymphoma. And they realized that, okay, if diffuse large B cell lymphoma is the prototype for aggressive lymphomas and follicular lymphoma is uh, the prototype for indolent lymphomas, there is this other lymphoma that with the same treatments that we are using for aggressive lymphomas has inferior outcomes. That's how um, the majority of cases of mantle cell lymphoma are also categorized as uh, aggressive lymphomas. So just to talk a little about diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, DLBCL comprises 30% of all non-Hodgkin lymphomas. About 20% of cases present with limited stage disease, stage one and stage two. And I'm sure our audience, they're all familiar how to stage lymphomas. If it's in one nodal station and um, you know, nodal station, uh, they have to be really careful. It's different from lymph node nodal. For example, cervical and supraclavicular, that's one nodal station. Above or below the diaphragm, that is stage one. If it's two nodal stations on the same side of diaphragm, that's stage two. Stage three is regardless of the number of nodal stations, but above and below the diaphragm. And stage four is when you have bone marrow involvement or so solid organ involvement, like lung involvement, kidney involvement, liver involvement. And um, one uh, topic that I wanna talk to you about and make sure that we're all on the same page is the immunophenotype. There are two immunophenotypes, germinal center B cell type and non-germinal center B cell type or activated B cell type. It's a DLBCL, so it expresses um, B cell markers like CD19, CD20, CD22, and CD45. There are some DLBCLs that express CD5. Some of them are transformation from an underlying SLL or CLL. But some of them are just um, DLBCL that is expressing CD5. And at least historically, we think these are DLBCLs that are associated with less favorable outcomes. And I put this here, which is not right, but primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma, it's an independent entity, but it used to be a subset of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Morphologically, they look like DLBCLs, but um, again, they express CD30 and they have molecular features that. Uh, a lot of it overlaps with Hodgkin lymphoma. And the patient population for primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma is young women mostly in their 20s and 30s. Of course, young male patients can get it too, um, who present with a huge mediastinal mass. Um, and um, it's also categorized as an extranodal marginal zone lymphoma, like CNS lymphoma. So there are. Um, once the diagnosis is established by a pathologist, um, you have to talk to patients about prognosis. There are different ways of prognosticating the LBCLs. One of them, which is the oldest one, is um, IPI or International Prognostic Index Score, which used all clinical factors. There are five clinical factors, age, stage, um, elevated LDH at presentation, poor performance status, and um, uh, extra nodal number of extra nodal sites. If a patient has more than one extra nodal site disease, uh, disease in the extra nodal sites, we know that those are patients who are going to be poor players. One of the more recent um, prognostic features is cell of origin that I'm going to spend some time and make sure that um, we all get that. 
I'm going to talk about double heat status uh, or uh, gene rearrangement in MIC BCL2 and BCL6 by fish. Um, I'm going to spend some time talking about double expressor uh, DLBCL. And there are also some more controversial prognostic features, like, you know, it's kind of intuitive that if someone is presenting with a high proliferative index, um, which is um, shown by KI67 in the PATH report, those are patients who have a more aggressive diffuse RGB cell lymphoma or someone who has CD5 expression, they're known to have, um, in some retrospective series, they're known to have um, inferior outcomes compared to DLBCLs who are not expressing CD5. So IPI was the first prognostic model that was introduced for diffuse large B-cell lymphomas, and we also use them for high-grade B-cell lymphomas. If a patient is above 60 years, if they have an elevated LDH at the time of presentation, if they have more than one extra nodal site at the time of diagnosis, they have a performance status of two or greater, which means being bed bound less than 50% of the time, um, and if they have advanced stage, these are patients that are associated with um, unfavorable outcomes. So this is from 1993. So this is in the pre-rituximab era. These numbers have all improved with rituximab. But as you see, the fewer risk factors you have, the better your outcomes are going to be. And then uh, the British Columbia Cancer Agency Group decided to revisit the IPI um, in the era of rituximab therapy, and they realized that all the same factors that they used in IPI, all those five factors, they still um, held true even in patients who were treated with rituximab. So in patients with rituximab who it treated with rituximab containing regimens who had few risk factors, IPI zero to one, they had very good outcomes. IPI two to three, they had reasonable fair outcomes and IPI four or five, they had poor outcomes. So that's a clinical uh, prognostic model that we continue to use to uh, inform our patients about their prognosis. But then um, they're really fortunate that they are living in the era of molecular uh, studies. And um, this was a very uh, interesting issue of New England Journal of Medicine. Um, in 2003, and they published two papers um, in that issue. One of them, um, they did gene expression profiling in patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and they introduced two new immunophenotypes based on gene expression profiling. One of them was germinal center B-cell-like, and the other one was activated B-cell-like or ABC or non-GCB. And then they realized that patients with GCB immunophenotype had better overall survival outcomes compared to patients with the ABC phenotype. Um, and this differentiation is extremely important, not only for prognostication, but also there are some drug opportunities in the relapsed refractory setting. Um, and it's very important to make this distinction clear from diagnosis. And in the same issue, I'm just going to briefly uh, touch upon this because I put it here. So they introduce IGHV mutation status in patients with CLL, and they realize that patients who are IGHV mutated, they have better outcomes compared to unmutated patients. And the reason is, uh, you know, in the mutated patient population, the B cell proliferation is halted at, an, at a later stage. So those are like more adult kids and you know, like adult kids, they behave uh, more reasonably. But in the wild type or unmutated IGHV, the B cell proliferation in CLL is halted at a very early stage. So there are, those are infant cells that behave erratically. You know, a lot of academic centers in the world, they don't have access to gene expression profiling at the time of diagnosis to make that differentiation between GCB and non-GCB. Here is when pathologists came to our rescue to use something really simple to be able to differentiate GCB versus non-GCB. Hans, he's a German um, pathologist. He had a very famous paper in 2009. He used a very simple algorithm to um, help us differentiate GCB versus non-GCB. And there is a 90 plus percent overlap between this simple algorithm that is purely based on immunohistochemical staining on the pathology report and gene expression profiling. So, um, you know, when I have trainees in my clinic, I always tell them, 
read the path report. If you if you do this five times, you'll commit this to memory. But nowadays, you know, a lot of our pathologists put GCB versus non-GCB in their path report. But there are three markers to look at. You start with CD10. So if CD10 is positive, you get your answer. This is GCB immunophenotype. And, um, you know, there are three uh, lymphomas that are CD10 positive. It's either GCB DLBCL or follicular lymphoma or Burkitt's lymphoma. But if CD10 is negative, the next immune marker that we check is BCL6. So go to the path report and look at BCL6. If BCL6 is negative, this is non-GCB. But if BCL6 is positive, the next immune marker to look at is MOM1. And then if MOM1 is positive, this is non-GCB. But if MOM1 is negative, this is GCB. So CD10 negative, MOM1 positive, I'm sorry, CD10 negative, BCL6 positive, MOM1 negative. These are patients who become GCB through the back door. So um, just practice, um, look at some CD10, BCL6, MOM1. I think it's a fun exercise to differentiate between GCB and non-GCB. Um, and other than immune phenotype, um, there are also some other features that can help us prognosticate a patient's um, lymphoma, large B-cell lymphoma or high-grade uh, B-cell lymphoma. So double hit or high-grade B-cell lymphoma with meek BCL2 and BCL6 gene rearrangement, you have to make this diagnosis using FISH and you look for translocations. Uh, you know, some centers only do MIC. If MIC is negative, they're not gonna spend money doing the other two because it's not going to be a double hit lymphoma. You need a MIC positive gene rearrangement um, to go to BCL2 and BCL6. If MIC gene rearrangement is positive, then you do both BCL2 and BCL6. If either of them is positive, it's gonna be a double hit lymphoma. Again, this is not a nomenclature that WHO uses. If all three of them are positive, they're gonna be labeled as triple hit lymphoma. There are about five to 10% of diffuse large B cell lymphomas. The cell of origin in double hit lymphoma is mostly germinal center B cell type. And double hit lymphomas are associated with lower CR, PFS, and OS without conventional treatments that we've been using for the LBCL, NOS, or not otherwise specified. And the um, outcomes are independent of cell of origin and IPI. So just having the double hit status is telling you that you have a challenging, you have an uphill battle with this lymphoma. It's going to be challenging to get this lymphoma in remission. There is another term that we use, and that's called double protein expression. And that is based on immunohistochemical staining for MIC and BCL2. It's about 20 30% of all diffuse large B cell lymphomas. This is not an independent entity. Um, cell of origin is usually non GCB. That's why, you know, if I have a non GCB and for whatever reason the sample was not enough and pathology cannot run the fish, I feel more comfortable because. Um, double hits are um, rarely non-GCB phenotype, but of course, exceptions are always there. Compared to diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, NOS, not otherwise specified, double protein expressors are also associated with lower CR, PFS, and OS. But that being said, their outcomes are not as, um, you know, guarded as double hit lymphomas. And then again, just having double protein expression also uh, makes it slightly more difficult for the lymphoma to put it in remission. Just to give you a visual understanding, so this is diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, germinal center, non-GCB. Here you see um, MIC gene rearrangement and BCL2 gene rearrangement, and the overlap is called double hit lymphoma. This can also be BCL6. As you see, the majority of double hit lymphomas, they're of, they're, they are of GCB phenotype. And then you have double protein expression. I didn't talk to you. So the cutoff for expression for MIC is 40%. For BCL2, um, at least in America, it's 50%. But I know in some Canadian, uh, in Canada and some European countries, they have a higher cutoff. It's 70%. And if there was a pathologist here, they would have told you this is totally subjective. You know, one pathologist might, might read it, look at the slide and read it as 50%, the other one um, 70%. But in general, MIC greater than 40 and BCL2 greater than 50%, we call it a double expressor lymphoma. And although you can see a good number of double expressors in the GCB phenotype, but the majority of them are in the non-GCB phenotype. 
And why that does this matter? Because here you see, even after you control for clinical factors, the, the blue uh, curve, the blue uh, line is DLBCL not otherwise specified, and the yellow one is double hit. So you see that both overall and PFS of patients who are double hit lymphoma with conventional treatments that we use for diffuse large B cell lymphoma, which is our job, and we'll talk about it is um, definitely inferior compared to patients who do not have double hit status. And this is actually um, a Kaplan-Meier curve that I always ask my fellows to focus on it and uh, kind of commit it to memory. So the blue line is DLBCL NOS, patients who are not double hit and not double expressor uh, status. The yellow one is double expressor and the gray one, these are double hits. So if the five year overall survival of DLBCL NOS with the current treatments is about 60%. You see that for the double expressor is about 40% and for double hit is about 20%. So this just tells us that we need better treatments for patients who are double hit and double expressor status, but what that treatment is going to be still to be determined. So um, the treatment for diffuse large B cell lymphoma is an anthracycline based therapy in the frontline setting. Um, it's, uh, you know, everyone who rotates in a lymphoma clinic, if there is one regimen that they have to learn really well, it's RCHOP, rituximab, cyclophosphamide, doxorubicin, linkristin, and prednisone. CHOP has been around since 1979, 1976. And then rituximab was added, and that was a huge revolutionary um, advancement in the field of B-cell malignancies. So you give it every three weeks for six cycles, you, can, you have to do an inner in PET CT. Some centers do it after two cycles, some do after four cycles, just to make sure patients are responding. They're not primary refractory. And then you also do another PET CT at the end of treatment to determine uh, remission status. For uh, limited stage diffuse large B cell lymphoma, stage one and two, very recently there've been trials, phase three trials, um, particularly FLYER, and um, so there are certain cooperative groups in America. One of them is Southwest Oncology Group. Different academic centers come together and try to answer an um, unanswered field in the in the field, uh, unanswered question in the field. Um, and one of the questions is: Do patients with limited stage do they really need six cycles of our chops? So the FLYER trial, which is a European trial, it uh, randomized patients with limited stage DLBCL to get um, standard of care, which was RCHOP times six versus RCHOP times four, followed by two doses of rituximab. And the RCHOP, the de-escalated arm, which was RCHOP times four, followed by two doses of rituximab was non-inferior to RCHOP times six. And the SWOG group, they did a study which was PET adapted. So they, did, they gave patients with limited stage DLBCL three cycles of RCHOP, they did a PET CT. If patients were in CR, complete remission, they only gave one more cycle of um, RCHOP with really good outcomes. So based on these two recent trials, we know that RCHOP times four for limited stage patients who achieve metabolic CR is an adequate treatment. And historically, we have also been using three cycles of RCHOP followed by uh, radiation therapy. But, you know, as medical oncologists, um, with all respect, you know, the, I have so much respect for radiation, uh, but you know, if we can avoid it, um, why not? We should try to avoid it. And then there is another regimen that I'll talk to you a little about. It's, it's called dose-adjusted EPOC-R. Um, in a huge disappointing phase three trial, which was called, it was run by another um, cooperative group in America called Alliance Group, 50303, they compared dose-adjusted EPOC-R with RCHOP, and um, there was no difference. The um, curves were totally over, they totally overlapped, which means there was no difference in outcomes. Um, but that study was not powered to answer the question of double hit lymphoma because they didn't have enough double hit lymphoma patients to uh, make that determination. And then another really controversial topic is CNS prophylaxis. Um, so we know that there are certain patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma that are going to be at risk of CNS relapse. Um, there is a prognostic CNS prognostic model called, called CNS IPI, which are the exact five um, clinical features that we use for IPI, plus um, 
kidney and adrenal involvement. So we know that patients who have involvement in their kidneys and in their adrenals, they have actually a higher risk of relapse in their central nervous system. Um, this question has never been answered in a randomized clinical trial setting um, prospectively, but based on the ret retrospective data, and you know, um, again, this is a very controversial topic, but um, I do um, CNS prophylaxis with um, intrathecal and also um, high-dose methotrexate. But then again, if you ask five experts, I think everyone agrees that um, CNS prophylaxis is indicated. The right route is yet to be determined. And um, it's a question it's, that needs to be answered in the field. What's the right way of doing it? Um, and then, yeah, here you see that uh, this is the old CHOP and then rituximab was added and really improved the outcomes um, significantly. You are never going to see um, a Kaplan-Meier care for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma um, with such distance between the, two between the two arms. So this is the old CHOP. And after rituximab was FDA approved in 2001, they added it to the backbone of a variety of regimens that they were using for different B-cell lymphomas. So then here you see that our CHOP in terms of PFS and OS significantly improved the outcomes of patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Um, I do want to talk to you about uh, those adjusted epoch R. Um, so it's the same, you see, CHOP, it's epoch. It's, it has one additional drug, etoposide. Um, the difference is our CHOP is given um, in one day, but epoch is um, continuous infusion. So rituximab is given on day one, and then there is an orange bag or a pump that contains etoposide between Christine and doxorubicin given in continuous infusion for 96 hours, days one to four, and then prednisone is administered orally days one to five and cyclophosphamide day five. Uh, but what is really important to understand, this regimen is called dose-adjusted EPOC-R. So it is important for patients to come between cycles and do labs every twice a week because the next dose level, the dose for their next cycle is going to be determined based on their ANC and platelet nadir uh, throughout the previous cycle. So if they don't drop their counts, you can escalate their dose by 20% for the next cycle. And using this method, this dose adjustment, um, in, especially in young patients, you can keep going up every, by 20% up until cycle four, cycle five. So they get significantly higher doses compared to our CHOP. Um, it is also, we have evidence that the risk of cardiotoxicity with anthracycline is less with uh, continuous infusion, those adjusted epoch R, but the risk of peripheral neuropathy with vincristin is higher. Um, and um, that's why we normally cap vincristin at two milligrams, even if you're giving it in the infusional um, manner. And then you know the side effects of a lot of these drugs, rituximab infusion related reactions, particularly with the first dose, because that's when the patient has the highest lymphoma burden. Etoposide is associated with cytopenias. Being Christine can cause really bad constipation. So encourage patients to get ahead of their game and start a bowel regimen if, they are, if they're starting with, the, with slow bowel movements. Doxorubicin is cardiotoxic. You definitely need to get an echocardiogram um, or evaluate their heart prior to initiating chemotherapy. Prednisone, you know, I always tell patients it's like having an extra cup of cappuccino in your blood. Some, some people enjoy that feeling, some people hate that feeling. And cyclophosphamide in rare cases can cause hemorrhagic cystitis. This is the CALGB5033 trial, the Alliance trial that compared um, RCHOP versus dose adjusted epoch R. Um, so um, the initial thought was patients with dose-adjusted EPOC-R, which is a more intense chemotherapy regimen, are going to do better, but we see they didn't necessarily. So more intense is not always the better answer. Um, but then again, the study was not powered to answer the question for double hit lymphoma patients. We talked a little about, a little about primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma, young patients, mostly women in their 20s and 30s, presenting with a mediastinal mass, um, the NCI group um, did a prospective study of patients uh, with primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma who got 
um, those adjusted epoch are. Up until that point, mostly these patients, like diffuse large B cell lymphoma patients, were getting RCHOP, and because they still had um, FDG avidity on their end of treatment PET CT, um, they had to proceed with mediastinal radiation. Um, and you know, this is a young patient population, young women. So ideally, you would definitely want to avoid radiation in this patient population to avoid future risk of breast cancer and radiation-induced cardiovascular toxicities. So with those adjusted EPOCR, this is also one of the most phenomenal uh, Kaplan-Meier curves that you see in, in any lymphoma. The five-year event-free survival with those adjusted EPOCR, six cycles was 93%, and the five-year overall survival was um, 97%. So although we do not have a randomized trial comparing epoch r versus r chopping primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma just based on the NCI prospective study, which was further validated by Stanford, by the Stanford group retrospective analysis of their primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma patients who received um, those adjusted epoch r This is the regimen that almost everyone uh, in the States uh, use for primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma patients. What about double hit lymphoma patients? So we know that these patients do not well with RCHOP. Remember that uh, CURB, uh, that DLBCL NOS 60%, double expressors 40% overall survival, and um, double hit lymphoma patients 20%. So what about other regimens? Let's see. Um, what we are gonna find. Uh, I want you to know that these are all retrospective studies. This question has not been answered prospectively, but they compared RCHOP, which is uh, something that we use, uh, a regimen that we use regularly in DLBCL patients, to more intense chemotherapy regimens like R hyper CBAT, those adjusted epoch R, R codox M IVAC, a regimen that we use for Burkitt lymphoma. And they saw that although with these intense regimens, um, the PFS is improved. Here you see that um, when you clump all these intensive regimens, um, the PFS is improved. But unfortunately, at the end of the day, the overall survival does not differ between intensive chemotherapy and RCHOP. So it's really challenging. Um, then they started looking at, okay, what about doing auto transplant? in patients with double hit lymphoma who achieve complete remission at the end of six cycles of chemotherapy, regardless of the chemotherapy that they get. And they realize that patients who do achieve CR and get autologous stem cell transplant as consolidation, their results are, their outcomes are not necessarily better than patients who were observed after six cycles of those adjusted epoch -R, and they were not consolidated with stem cell transplant. And um, you know, then they looked at patients with double hit lymphoma status. Again, these are all retrospective, retrospective studies. And you know that retrospective studies, they're fraught with bias, but this is the best we have. Patients who did get um, methotrexate containing prophylactic regimens compared to no CNS prophylaxis, they had improved overall survival. And patients with CNS involvement and double hit lymphoma that's unfortunately a very difficult patient population to treat. And here JCO um, did the same analysis on a larger number of patients and they realized that um, with more intensive chemotherapy regimens, um, the PFS or relapse free survival does improve but the overall survival does not necessarily improve. Um, all that being said, um, you know, at my center and a good number of um, academic institutions, uh, we do treat double hit lymphoma with dose adjusted epoch R. And regardless of CNS IPI score, um, we do consider uh, CNS prophylaxis for this patient population. Um, but then again, I want you to know that this is not based on a prospective um, randomized clinical trial, and that's a question that hopefully we are going to be able to answer in the next few years and find the right treatment for these really aggressive, um, these patients with this really aggressive lymphoma. Then what's going to happen if someone relapses? Um, so about one third of patients uh, with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma um, who get upfront chemotherapy with an anthracycline-based regimen, uh, unfortunately, 
they either relapse or they're primary refractory, meaning they never achieve any kind of remission. So uh, this is in the pre-rituximab era. Um, these patients received salvage uh, with DHAP, dexamethasone, high dose RSC, cisplatin times two. And if they were, and if they achieved CR or PR based on CT scan, then they were randomized to either receive four more cycles of salvage chemotherapy or autologous stem cell transplantation. And here you see that patients who actually received transplantation did really well. So the treatment recommendation for patients with relapsed diffuse large B cell lymphoma is, is a rituximab containing salvage chemotherapy followed by autologous stem cell transplantation. And there are different salvage regimens that are available. Um, RSC based regimens like our DHAP, um, you know, cisplatin is really difficult on a good number of patients. And after one cycle, they develop cisplatin induced nephropathy. So we normally replace um, cisplatin with either uh, carboplatin, which is going to be, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm seeing something. Adi Reza Gudarzi. Okay. Um, we normally replace cisplatin with, a, with another platinum agent like carboplatin, or DHAC, or oxaliplatin, or DHOX. Um, and then there are um, other platinum-based regimens, salvage regimens available, like rice, rituximab, ifosfamide, carboplatin, and etoposide. And, you know, for patients who are older, our GEMOX is also another option, which is gemcitabine, oxaliplatin. And then... Um, after salvage, we do, after two cycles of salvage, we do a PET CT if patients are in CR or a good PR. A good PR is not a scientific term, but by that I mean, you know, not all PRs are similar. Not all partial remissions are similar. You have a patient who had multiple sites of disease, then after two cycles of salvage, you PET them, you do a PET CT and you realize that um, all areas are gone, but they have a little FDG uptake in one side. So that's a, that's a very good PR. That's, that's great. You, that patient is definitely chemosensitive and can proceed with autologous stem cell transplant. But if, you know, you have another patient with multiple involved sites, they get two cycles of salvage, you um, do a PET CT and you realize that all those lesions are still there, although they're not as FDG avid as they used to be, that's not a good PR. This patient is telling you that um, they are not chemosensitive. So if patients achieve CR or a good PR, then we take them for autologous stem cell transplant. And I know everyone in this audience knows that, um, you know, uh, autologous stem cell transplantation, there are two major steps. One of them is stem cell mobilization and collection, and then autologous um, high dose chemotherapy followed by autologous stem cell rescue. In the stem cell mobilization and collection, you give patients GCSF, mobilize the stem cells, to come to peripheral blood, um, then the patient gets hooked up to a machine that looks like a dialysis machine. And that machine is designed in a way to identify stem cells based on their um, CD34 immune marker. And the stem cells get collected. It goes to a special freezer. And then the patients come in, they get high dose chemotherapy. There are different regimens available. We normally use BEAM, BCNU, etoposide, RSC, melphalan. And then the frozen cells will come to the bedside, we thaw them, and we infuse them to the patient. And then the engraftment takes about two to three weeks, and it can be done as outpatient or inpatient. And um, a good number of patients with relapsed diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, particularly patients who are not primary refractory, meaning at some point they achieve some sort of CR and their disease came back later, and also late relapses, relapses that are not in the first year of um, completion of chemotherapy. Those are patients that still have, can have really good outcomes with autologous stem cell transplantation. And what's going to happen if, um, you know, after autologous stem cell transplantation, someone relapses or someone is not a candidate for autologous stem cell transplantation, you know, um, an auto is not easy. You know, you have to have a good heart. You have to have a good performance status. Um, so there are some palliative options available, not necessarily curative. Um, one of those options is um, single agent, um, you know, uh, lenalidomide, which is an immunomodulatory agent. It was studied. Um, and this is another reason why the uh, 
immune phenotype is important. The cell of origin is important. As you see in the relapsed refractory settings with single agent zinedinamide, the response rate in non-GCB phenotype is 50 plus percent, whereas in the GCB phenotype is less than 10%. That being said, if you have a patient with GCB, DLBCL, and you want, they're old, they're frail, they cannot tolerate so many intense options, uh, you still give lenalidomide. It still makes sense to give lenalidomide a chance. Um, and then there are other options, BTK inhibitors. Here, uh, there is a study of ibrutinib. Again, you see that in the ABC phenotype, the response rate with single agent ibrutinib was about 40% whereas in the GCB was about 5%. But still, this is also a very reasonable and well-tolerated oral drug in patients uh, in the relapsed refractory setting who cannot um, pursue a curative route and you wanna put them on a palliative route. And um, so it makes sense now that you know these agents work in the relapsed refractory setting, put them in the front line to see if the outcome of um, patients with DLBCL who are treatment naive is going to improve. So the field has done everything. They added bortezomib, which is a proteasome inhibitor to RCHOP, RVCHOP, and there was no benefit. There, none of these studies were positive studies. Um, then they added the recent Phoenix trial, added ibrutinib to RCHOP. This study did not meet its primary endpoint. If you do subset analysis, they saw some signals, but it did not improve the, it did not meet the primary endpoint to be a positive trial. Um, and the other one was R squared CHOP, which was rituximab, revlimid CHOP, again, did not meet its primary endpoint. Um, I didn't put it here, but last week um, there was a press release with RCHP, no vincristine, and the vincristine was um, replaced with Polituzumab vidotin, which is a CD79 antibody drug conjugate. So antibody drug conjugate is an antibody um, toward a specific marker on the surface of the B cells, in this case, CD79, conjugated with a chemo agent. So it takes the chemotherapy agent directly to the um, target cell, which is the CD79 cancer cell. Uh, lymphoma cells. So our chip plus polituzumab apparently met the primary endpoint, but I didn't put it here because, you know, we have to wait for more information to become available. But if you have heard, um, I just wanted to know that it's a press release. Um, we don't know much about it. Okay, so um, I do also want to talk about CAR T-cell therapy. It's a very exciting time for the treatment of B-cell lymphomas. Um, where is the place of CAR T therapy in the current treatment paradigms for diffuse large B cell lymphoma or high grade B cell lymphomas? So, we talked about frontline that we give these patients anthracycline um, uh, based therapy. Um, and then, about one third of these patients, unfortunately, will not achieve um, either, they'll never achieve remission, their primary refractory, or they will relapse later. So that's when you take these patients for second line therapy that we talked about, which is salvage chemotherapy followed by high dose therapy and autologous stem cell rescue. But there are also some patients who either never achieve a CR or a PR to salvage chemotherapy, or they undergo autologous stem cell transplant and they relapse later. So currently in America, the FDA label for CAR T therapy are, diffuse, are patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma who have failed two prior lines of therapy. So upfront therapy and either salvage or the whole um, treatment strategy of uh, autologous stem cell transplant. What is CAR T therapy? So um, the first step is leukophoresis, kind of like stem cell mobilization and collection. But here patients get hooked up to a machine that looks like a dialysis machine, but this machine is designed in a way that is capable of uh, identifying T cells based on their markers, CD4 and CD8. And then once the T cells, the patient's own T cells are collected, actually, let me take a step back. Uh, I want to tell you how I talk to a patient about CAR T cell therapy. So I always tell them, you know, if I get breast cancer, colon cancer, brain cancer, lymphoma, my own T cells are the first responders. They show up to the battlefield and they do their very best to overcome the 
cancer. But unfortunately, cancer cells always find a way to outsmart our T cells and our T cells get misled and they lose the battle. So what are some ways to make our T cells smart to be vigilant in identifying cancer cells and don't get misled? That's when um, we collect patients' T cells. We send them to their certain companies in the US and there are also some manufacturing centers associated with academic centers that do this. They isolate and they activate the T cell and then they engineer these T cells with chimeric antigen receptor gene. And these CAR T cells, they have a targeting element which, which identifies the target. In our case, when we're talking about lymphomas, that's gonna be CD19. And then it has a co-stimulatory domain and it also has a signaling domain. And then once this CAR receptor is engineered in patients' own T cells, then it's time to expand these CAR T cells, increase um, them in number. And once the manufacturing process is over, it takes about two to four weeks. Um, and you know, these are patients with really bad aggressive lymphomas. So they cannot just sit there. This is not an off the shelf product. They cannot just sit there and um, you know, get no treatment because their lymphoma is crashing and burning and they really need some other treatment until that can hold them for one month to get to CAR T. So during these two to four weeks, they get some bridging therapy as a bridge to CAR T therapy. So these are patients who are very refractory to chemotherapy. So it honestly doesn't make much sense to give them chemotherapy knowing that they've already failed two prior lines of chemotherapy containing regimens. So you have to be, have to be creative. You either give them um, radiation therapy to the worst lesions that are really at risk of um, explosion, getting really big. Um, or, you know, we use targeted agents. Um, there are some treatments that have been recently approved and they're being used as um, bridging therapy until, you know, you just give them something to hold them for one month. Um, and it's not only one month because their insurance approval takes a while. So the best case scenario is one month. And when the CAR T cells are sent from the company to the academic institution, you infuse, they get admitted, and I will tell you uh, what's gonna happen. So here you see apheresis. This is where we collected T cells, send them to a manufacturing center to uh, build the CAR T cells. It takes about two to four weeks and pa patients need some sort of, the majority of patients need some sort of bridging chemotherapy or targeted therapy or radiation therapy. And then they get three days or two days based on the product of lymphodepleting chemotherapy to deplete their autologous T cells because they're gonna receive these super T cells. They're gonna receive these CAR T cells. And then after three days or two days of lymphodepleting chemotherapy, here they get the CAR T infusion. Um, for some patients, we do CAR T cell therapy in the outpatient setting, but some patients are really sick and they need to be supervised in um, a more controlled setting. CAR T, the two major toxicities, one of them is cytokine release syndrome or CRS, and the other one is neurotoxicity. Um, CRS is, uh, you know, these T cells, these CAR T cells are ready to fight. So there are gonna be a lot of inflammatory mediators released when you give these patients CAR T cells. Um, and, you know, we have learned a lot how to manage uh, CAR T therapy. So one of the agents that we use is called um, tocilizumab, which is an IL-6 receptor antagonist. And we can, there are also other agents that are currently being studied, and we also use uh, steroids. And the other toxicity is neurotoxicity, and that's when these inflammatory mediators, cr they cross the blood-brain barrier and get into the central nervous system. And we now know how to manage those patients with steroids. And for the first month after getting CAR T therapy, they have to stay um, locally um, so that, you know, if they develop any toxicities, they can come to us and we can manage them. Um, there are a total of um, basically four products approved for, um, I'm sorry, uh, four um, different CAR T cells are approved for uh, patients with B-cell lymphomas. Um, there are um, 
structure is slightly different. Here you see that the co-stimulatory uh, domains for some uh, CD28 is used for some 41BB is used. And in general, 41BB products are better tolerated. They're associated with less CRS and less neurotoxicity. And here they get different um, axicaptogen silaleucil. This was Zuma1 trial or Yescarda product. Histogenic Lucel, this is Kim Raya or um, the Juliet trial. And the most recent one, Lysacaptogen Malleucel, this was the uh, Transcend 001 trial. So, um, and the lymphodepleting chemotherapy is flu sci for all of them, but for the TISA cell product, um, Bendamustin, which is a very good lymphodepleting chemotherapy, can also be used. And they have their indication. So for Axisil, you use that for patients with relapsed refractory diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, high-grade B-cell lymphoma, primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma. Recently, the follicular, it was also approved for follicular lymphoma. The uh, TISA cell, um, it is approved for, um, it has a very uh, novel uh, FDA indication for pediatric ALL up until the age of 26. It is also approved for DLBCL and high-grade B-cell lymphoma, but it is not approved for primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma. So if you have a patient with primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma, you either use you know, Axicel or Lysacel. The indications for Lysacel is very much similar to Axicel. And Brexocaptogen autolucel, this was also approved for relapsed refractory mantle cell lymphoma patients after two previous lines of therapy, which was um, quite an achievement for patients with mantle cell lymphoma. And um, just a quick uh, visual um, understanding, visual uh, depiction of what's going on. So you see it in all three trials, the Zuma one, Juliet and Transcend with different products, about 40% of patients who otherwise didn't have any curative options available, you know, up until 27 off clinical trials, those were patients that had to go for either allo transplant, allogeneic stem cell transplant, or if they didn't have the performance status to go to undergo an allo transplant, they would have been put on a palliative route. Now 40% of those patients achieve long-term remissions. 40% of patients with really bad high-grade B-cell lymphomas and diffuse large B-cell lymphomas um, are basically um, going into complete remission with CAR-T therapy. There are some um, uh, more recent FDA approved combinations for diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Um, these are all palliative. Um, one of them uh, was, they were all uh, approved uh, last summer. So one of them is tafacitamab plus lenalidomide. Tafa is a CD19 monoclonal antibody. And the, the label is for um, relapsed refractory DLBCL, including DLBCL that is transformed from uh, an underlying follicular lymphoma in patients who don't have any other options or they're not candidates for an auto transplant. And the other option is the oral selinexor. Selinexor is an Expo-1 inhibitor. Expo-1 is a nuclear um, exporter. So um, it basically exports all the tumor suppressor genes from inside the nucleus um, outside. So if you inhibit it, you're going to keep all those tumor suppressor genes inside the cell. So mm, that helps kill the cell. So the next SOR is oral, but it's not a very well tolerated um, oral drug. It is associated with a lot of um, GI toxicities. Um, so it's really one of our last resorts. But that being said, there is anecdotal evidence that it has activity in patients with um, primary and secondary CNS lymphoma who have failed other conventional treatments like methotrexate, lenalidomide, ibrutinib. And one that I did not put here is BR polituzumab. Um, there was a trial comparing bendamustine rituximab, which we use for a lot of indolent lymphomas, versus bendamustine rituximab polituzumab, the CD79 monoclonal antibody. Uh, I'm sorry, antibody dr drug conjugate, CD79 antibody drug conjugate. And um, patients who received BR POLA and were not transplant candidates did better compared to patients who received BR. Um, I'm sorry, I think I'm going to stop here and I'm happy to take um, questions.
Sorry, can anyone hear me? So I can I, I have access to a chat section if there are any questions that you want to type in in the chat section yeah. until Dr. Good, yeah, Dr. Uh, Rezvani or Dr. Yasser. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rahmi. I'm sorry, am I not hearing you or? Dr. Dudarzi. Dr. Fakhri, two people raised hand, they can ask their question. Sure, absolutely, uh, please go ahead. Okay. Please give the microphone to Dr. Gudarzi. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can totally hear you. Please go ahead. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you for your great talk. Uh, and I wanted to ask uh, your opinion about the best choice you are giving uh, elderly people uh, who are uh, also, uh, I think, uh, probably uh, comorbid for getting these uh, high intense regimens. Uh, what is your option uh, pro uh, providing to these people with DLBCL? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, you know, that's a great question. Um, I, um, you know, basically uh, an, uh, old patients, that's a very heterogeneous category, but in general, my first choice is our mini chop based on a French study. And it's the same drugs, our mini chop, cyclophosphamide is 400 milligrams per meter squared and the rest, um, doxorubicin is 25 milligrams per meter squared. The increased in is one, um, mill uh, one milligram total and prednisone is also half the dose. And that French study uh, showed that our mini chop um, in older patients, and I think I have to check the publication, but I think the age range, uh, the high um, end of the age range was 86, 87. So they had included uh, octogenarian patients as well. And those patients did pretty well with our mini chop. And if I feel like I have an old patient who cannot tolerate anthracycline therapy because of you know, multiple cardiovascular comorbidities, as you mentioned, um, one regimen that I consider is RCOP, rituximab, cyclophosphamide, etoposide, the increased in prednisone, or um, there is actually a retrospective series um, published from my um, I didn't publish it, but published from my fellowship program, if you want to uh, Google that, RCOP. Um, and there is also um, an old Stanford study that uses RCEP, C-E-P-P. -P. It's cyclophosphamide, etoposide, procarbazine, and prednisone. And, you know, um, older patients tolerate that regimen well. So our mini chop, our CEOP, um, and our SEP are my to go options if I am still um, treating someone with curative intent, if that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Of course. I can actually um, see a question from Mohamed Reza Rostami. Um, what is my approach when CNS involved at presentation? And what chemotherapy do you prefer for solely CNS relapse? That's a great question. I just want to let you know, this is a very controversial topic. Um, I will tell you my approach, but if you ask different experts, you might get different answers. If someone has CNS involvement at the time of diagnosis, um, I know that we all know that combining those adjusted epoch R and high dose methotrexate 
is um, almost impossible. It's going to result in multiple dose delays. Their epoch R is going to be dose delayed. So in those cases, I pick RCHOP and systemic methotrexate. So we call it RM CHOP, Rituxia methotrexate CHOP. They get RCHOP on day one. And then on day 14, around the time that they've uh, recovered their counts, they get high dose methotrexate. And then they have one week to clear methotrexate and be ready for the second cycle of RCHOP. So um, I normally use high dose methotrexate almost always in patients who actually have CNS involvement. And um, if their CSF flow and cytology is positive on the day of RCHOP, I also give them LP chemo IT chemotherapy with methotrexate. If they tolerate it, good for them. If they develop a lot of mucositis resulting in those delays, um, then, you know, um, basically it's, it's challenging. You just try to walk, decrease the dose of um, high dose methotrexate to make sure that you prevent those delays as much as possible, if that answers your question. Excuse me, Dr. Fahri. Uh, if a pet is, in, uh, uh, is not feasible in our center. I'm sorry, much... sorry, can you please repeat yourself? I didn't hear you for a second. If PET scan is uh, not feasible in our center, how much decrease in diameter of the node is acceptable in the interim evaluation in the, uh, after the two cycle of chemotherapy, after two cycle of workshop? How many decrease are acceptable in, acceptable in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I mean, power to you guys, because I'm, I, I am really spoiled um, using PET. So um, I believe um, I'm just giving you an uneducated answer. This is not something that I've studied, but I think, um, you know, if the majority, you know, the problem with CT scan is sometimes the lesions don't necessarily shrink because a lot of it is going to be scar tissue. That's why PET is helpful because you know, especially if you're starting with, you know, a 12 centimeter mass, um, I've seen PET cities that the mass was still eight centimeters, but it did not have any FDG uptake. So it's really challenging with CT scan. Um, but I think we can get a general idea of um, if there is global shrinkage that is basically telling us, okay, this patient is responding. Knowing that um, with CT, the majority of patients are never going to go back to complete normal less than one and a half centimeters that we want them to be. Um, so I think just um, a global shrinkage in the majority of lesions should be reassuring. But that being said, uh, this is not something that I deal with and I cannot give you an educated answer. Uh, excuse me, another question. Um, if after the first line salvage chemotherapy, you have any residual in patients, you try to a uh, second line chemotherapy for complete response or PET negativity before the autologous transplant? That's a great question. So if, um, you know, I start with less intense salvage therapies like our Gemox and I give two cycles and the response is really good, but I think um, is not ideal, is not where I want it to be. Um, and the patient is doing better, and I feel like they can tolerate a more intense chemotherapy regimen, then I escalate it to, you know, either an ROC based regimen or rice, if they can tolerate it, of course. Um, but, you know, nowadays, um, I really feel like we have to, our goal should be getting someone into as close to CR before getting, before going for autologous transplant as much as we can. So if someone, you know, we are confident that they're chemo sensitive. Um, they just need a little more work to get to near CR. Um, I would change the regimen. It has happened to me. Thank you. My colleague, if you have any comment or any question. Uh, Dr. Rashidi. Yes, hello. Thank you very much for lecturing. Can you hear me, please? I can hear you. Thank you very much for lecturing. And I am staying in Africa, Malia. Uh, that is the perfect lecture for today. We are never uh, 
and uh, we need uh, more more details of uh, that those, uh, that problem the our agency the more problem and I did uh, there any article related for that uh, you are doing? thank you very much I'm really sorry you kept getting disconnected um if anyone heard you completely, can you please let me know or can you repeat yourself? I'm sorry, you're, I couldn't completely hear you. There are any articles about? If there, if please, uh, thank you very much. I, and uh, there are any? Hello, can you yeah, hear you, me? Please? Yeah, I can hear you. Thank you very much. Is there any article is related to that you are doing? Please type in the chat room. Victor, I should please type your question in chat room. Your voice is not clear. Dr. Rezwani, three other people raise their hand. They can also ask their question. Yeah. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, uh, I just have another question. I wanted to know if there is any newer data available on the role of uh, lenalidomide in uh, treating uh, GLBCL in the frontline setting or as a uh, maintenance uh, as you are aware of. So, um, you know, on the, on the remark study, they uh, conclude that lenalidomide might be good in, uh, in you know, maintenance therapy uh, and in, increase uh, PFS, I think. Uh, is there any newer data on uh, confirming this information? Sure. So as, as you mentioned, as, and as I try to um, point out in my talk, these new agents are extensively being studied in the front line. But to become practice changing and change the treatment paradigm, we have to see overall survival benefits. So PFS is a very reasonable endpoint but if you know, a treatment you know, improves PFS without necessarily improving overall survival, that's not going to change the treatment landscape. So, so far, um, none of the agents that have been added to the frontline RCHOP backbone have been able to show OS benefit, um, overall survival benefit. And in terms of maintenance, um, lenalidomide, so, um, I am not aware personally of maintenance lenalidomide outside myeloma for, um, you know, lymphoma patients, the goal is either cure or palliative route. So for cure, you ideally want to, um, you know, give them some time limited therapy and put them in remission, prolong remission. But for in the palliative setting, lenalidomide is continued as long as the patient is tolerating uh, LEN and as long as their disease is responding. So, and a good number of patients, they go for almost one year with the LEN treatment. Uh, Dr. Rashidi, uh, type that I mean about the COVID vaccine. Dr. Rashidi, please complete your question. COVID vaccine. Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, the COVID situation everywhere is just, is really heartbreaking. Um, I actually, uh, so we know that patients who receive rituximab, there are different studies coming out uh, from different centers that patients who receive the, uh, the Leukemia Lymphoma Society in America did a study um, on how patients who had received rituximab in the past few months responded to COVID vaccine. They measured the spike antibody and patients who had received rituximab recently, they did not basically produce any antibody. That being said, we are able to measure B cell immunity. We are not able to measure T cell immunity. But um, if I have a patient with high grade B cell lymphoma, and those are patients who need treatment yesterday, you can't even wait, you know, you really need to go. Um, you, I just have a very serious talk with them that 
you have to be extra careful. Even if you get the vaccine right now, we want to start treatment and you are not going to mount an immune response. So there is no point in get, getting the vaccine right now. So for high grade B cell lymphomas, I start treatment right away. But if you have a, a patient with indolent lymphoma that you have the luxury of waiting, for example, someone has follicular lymphoma, uh, you know that they need treatment, but not necessarily today. They can wait for a few months. Those are patients that we highly encourage them to go get vaccinated and we try to delay the initiation of treatment as long as we can. Of course, we don't want the disease to become problematic, but if we have the luxury of waiting for follicular marginal zone lymphoma, indolent lymphomas, we vaccinate them, wait for three plus months if we have that option and then start their treatment. But for high grade B cell lymphomas, even if you vaccinate them and you start with toxin containing, containing regimen, you know that they're not going to mount an immune response. So the vaccine is not going to do much for them. And um, is, are there any hands? Otherwise, I can go through um, the chat section. Uh, from uh, is craniospinal radiation mandatory in patient with positive CSF and abdominal injury and adjunct to systemic and intertypical therapy? Um, sure. So if someone has, um, you know, CNS therapy, even if it's primary CNS lymphoma, um, is that the question or secondary CNS lymphoma? Sorry. Uh, in primary spinal radiation, mandatory in patient with positive oh, okay, CSF. Okay, okay, I, I see that, uh, Dr. Paykar. Um, I avoid radiation at all costs in patients with lymphoma, you know, it's whole brain radiation. It's just, it's just gonna change the person of that person, you know, the soul of it. it's, it's um, a very toxic treatment modality. And um, I avoid it at all costs. That being said, we do gamma knife in certain cases um, that are really refractory to conventional treatments. And by conventional treatments, I mean high-dose methotrexate, intrathecal methotrexate, cytarabine. If they don't respond to high-dose methotrexate, we give them either high-dose ibrutinib, 840 milligrams, although you have to dose reduce because you have to put those patients on azole for fungal prophylaxis. Um, Revlimid has good activity in CNS lymphomas. Selinexor, there is anecdotal evidence that has activity in CNS lymphoma. And, you know, we also know that uh, there are um, early phase studies that show uh, checkpoint inhibitors, nivolumab, has activity in CNS lymphoma. So if all else fails, if none of these options are getting the patient to where we want her or him to be, then we refer them for gamma knife radiation. But um, whole brain radiation therapy. Um, if I get to that point with a patient, I have a goals of care discussion with them. And I tell them, in my opinion, um, you know, that's not something I want anyone to do for me. And I'm not going to recommend it to anyone. And I, we have referred patients to radiation oncologists, and they're not a fan of whole brain radiation therapy. If that answers your question. Uh, Dr. Fahri, my dear colleague, Dr. Saifi, asked about the uh, difference between general center and non general center treatment in your center. That's a great question. In the upfront setting, we don't treat them any differently. Um, they all get anthracycline based therapy. Um, in um, the fir at first relapse, they all go for um, salvage auto. At second relapse, we can, if they are eligible for CAR-T, we consider them for CAR-T. Um, but if they are relapsed refractory, not eligible for auto, not eligible for um, CAR-T cell therapy, uh, as I showed, patients with non-GCV, they have higher response rates to BTK inhibitors and also higher response rates to Revlimid. That being said, I wouldn't deprive a GCV patient from these options because about five to 10% of them would respond to these treatment options. 
Um, and um, also in the relapsed refractory setting, particularly EBV positive DLB cells, we consider giving them checkpoint inhibitors like nivolumab or pembrolizumab. But just based on the, um, the cell of origin gives us a lot of prognostic information and also predictive information, meaning, um, you know, you, as I showed, non-GCV patients, they have uh, less favorable outcomes compared to GCV. And if someone is non-GCV and you start them on these novel agents, you expect them to have higher response rates. But in terms of upfront first relapse and second relapse, we don't um, treat them differently. Um, Dr. Shadman, right hand. Yeah, thank you for the great talk. I have a question about, uh, think about a patient in Iran, you know, who needs a uh, treatment for salvage. And so we know CAR T is not available, unfortunately, at least now. And, uh, you know, patients, I'm sure you get emails. I get a lot of emails, patients who have tried something like rice or maybe another salvage. And the goal is to get them to auto transplant. You mentioned there are a few newly approved FDA drugs. Uh, they're all very expensive. Let's imagine a patient who maybe has the means to get one of these drugs. What would be the most uh, cost-effective drug to use if somebody is willing to pay and bring this drug from another country between polatuzumab, vedotin, you mentioned selinexor, you mentioned tafacitumab, there is now uh, lonclostoxumab, the CD19 ADC. Uh, you know, because this happens, you know, we, of course, we don't want a patient to pay for selling Exor. It's a lot of money. And if you don't have experience using these drugs, uh, it's difficult to make a decision. Can you make a comment if somebody wants to pay for something expensive, which one of these maybe four newly approved drugs they should really invest on? Sure. Um, so I, in my personal experience, BR polituzumab um, is the best next salvage regimen to get someone to, um, you know, auto transplant. Um, it ha it is associated with high response rates, and um, bendamustine rituximab is available everywhere, and it's it's just adding polituzumab, um, polituzumab which is which is a great medicine, and especially now that we've heard in the frontline setting. Again, this is just the press release. Uh, it, it makes me think that maybe uh, it is going to be, you know, the most effective. Again, you know, they haven't been compared um, uh, directly, Tafa Land versus BR Pola. But just my gut feeling, if we want to get someone to auto transplant um, and we just want an extra, uh, some extra um, help from another treatment option, among all the things that you mentioned, Tafa, Lens, Selinexor, uh, Lankestoximab, I would personally choose BR polituzumab. Excuse me, yeah. Dr. Fakhri, another question. What's your treatment option for patients with primary refractory prefra T cell lymphoma after maintaining complete remission with salvage remission? Autologous or allotransplant? I take these patients for allo transplant because you know PTCLs um, who have already relapsed after upfront treatment um, uh, and they can get into CR with salvage regimen. Um, I take these patients for allo transplant, reduce intensity uh, conditioning. I also got some. Um, personal messages. So um, I think um, someone was uh, asking, uh, they expected that some subjects were about lab diagnosis. Um, and this session was completely clinical. So, um, and they've asked, I should, have, I should have included partners who engaged in lab medicine. Um, I, I hear you loud and clear, but you know, I'm not a pathologist. Um, and I couldn't communicate, you know, um, lab and molecular um, concepts as eloquently as an as a pathologist could. But, but I heard you, and um, I will definitely consider next time. My colleague, do you have any, another question about the lecture?
هستش تنکیو دکتر فخری ویلی ویلی انفرمیتی و نایس لکچر I can find the answer in what some big problem with all patients about salvage chemotherapy and CT scan because PET scan is not feasible in most of the area in Iran. And we follow and evaluate patients with CT scan. Big problem for evaluation of response uh, after interim analysis and in the end of the treatment. No, I can only really imagine, yeah, and, and again, power to you. Uh, I, you know, we should learn from you guys how you assess response based on CT because it is a truly challenging assessment. Okay, I mean. Yeah, Thank you, yeah. Dr. Fakhri, for your great presentation. Uh, Dr. Musavi, can you hear me? Uh, Dr. Yeah, Musavi? Yeah. Hello, hello, uh, Dr. Yagmai. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Fakhri, for a nice presentation. Uh, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shadman for uh, coordination and collaboration. Thank you, uh, Dr. Yagmai, and thank you, Dr. Rezvani, for uh, your moderation. Thank you very much. Uh, very nice presentation. Thank you for the kind words. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.